Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar series, uh, Grace and Speed, Muskoka Wooden Boat Stories. My name is John Miller, President of Muskoka Steamships and Discovery Center. And first, we'd like to acknowledge the First Peoples, who for thousands of years before us were and are still the keepers and caretakers of this land where we now live and work. We're dedicated to honoring the Indigenous history and culture and committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect with all First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. In particular for Muskoka, all four cultures, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat and Métis that inhabited these lands either currently or historically. We recognize all the generations of Indigenous people and their historic connection to this place. And we're grateful for the opportunity to gather here at this time. This series is a digital component of our $8.5 million revitalization project at the Muskoka Discovery Center. The physical transformation of our building is almost complete with three dynamic exhibits being created that are growing and evolving with inspired content. Those exhibits are The Evolution of Muskoka, a story about how through a process of conflict and resolution, the storied area of Ontario evolved after first contact to become most, one of the most important tourist destinations in the world. Miskawaki, Confluence of Cultures. This is a presentation about four Indigenous cultures with a presence in Muskoka for thousands of years, all of which have teachings to share about sustainability and care for our, our environment. And Wanda Three. Wanda is our 108-year-old steam yacht presently in the middle of an electrification repowerment. She'll be a working artifact when she's complete and, important, and an important symbol of sustainability. The Muskoka Steamships and Discovery Center in partnership with Antique and Classic Boat Society is excited to present, present this series of eight webinars showcasing wooden works of art that, that have made Muskoka home to arguably the best concentration of quality wooden boats in the world. Our volunteer team of Chris Bullen, who captured all the video and still images, Ian Turnbull, Mary Story, Murray Walker, Ed Skinner, and Rick Terry, along with many boat owners have put in countless hours to produce this series and we're extremely grateful for their contributions. I'd also like to thank Jordan Waynes and Ann Curley, who are working behind the scenes to make this webinar happen. This entire series, when complete, will be available in our archives, on our website, and as a permanent display within the Muskoka Discovery Center. Following the video presentation, which is approximately 40 minutes long today, we'll have a Q&A with our panelists. Uh, this is an entertaining part of the webinar, so please post questions in our Q with the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll read them to our panelists when the video is complete. I'd like to introduce Ian Turnbull to say a few words, and then please enjoy our presentation, and we'll see you at the Q&A afterwards. Ian. Thank you, John. I just had a couple of uh, short comments. First of all, last week, uh, one of the boats we looked at was Aegis 6, a very nice little ditch burn, a very fast gentleman's racer, as you may recall. And on one slide, I had the length indicated as being shorter than the boat really is, which is the bad thing to do with a wooden boat. The boat, in fact, is 25 feet long. So that's point one. Uh, point two, in this particular episode, we're going to see three kinds of propulsion of wooden boats. Internal combustion, which we're used to. Steam, which we haven't seen too much of. And finally, electric. So at the end in your Q&A, make sure that we can discuss all these points. On with the show, thanks. Hello again, good to be back with you for episode three of Muskoka Wooden Boat Stories, brought to you by Muskoka Steamships and Discovery Center and the Antique and Classic Boat Society Toronto. I'm Ian Turnbull. On behalf of our production team, Chris Pullen, Murray Walker, Mary Story, Rick Terry, and Ed Skinner. In our first two episodes, we looked at nine boats built in the first three decades of the last century. They were built in Gravenhurst or Bracebridge. They traveled at speed with substantial engines, and in general, they were built for wealthy cottagers, many of whom were American. In this episode, we have a very different focus, looking at a little boat with a little engine built in Port Carling for a clientele of modest means. In our following episodes, we will return to bigger and more powerful craft with colorful histories. Our feature boat today has many names. The Disappearing Propeller Boat, the Dippy, or maybe the best name of all, 
the greatest little motorboat afloat. Sometimes when it misbehaves, it's called other names, but not too often. This is the cover of an excellent book written almost 40 years ago. The title says it all, The Greatest Little Motorboat Afloat, The Legendary Disappearing Propeller Boat. Written by Paul Doddington, Joe Fossey, Paul Gockel, Bill Ogilvie, and Jim Smith, and published by Boston Mills Press in 1983. The book expertly documents dispro history and is an informative, entertaining read. We need to consider why the wooden boat industry took shape here and why today Muskoka remains a boating haven. It's because of the watershed, stretching east from Algonquin Park to Georgian Bay in the west. It's because the watershed contains large lake systems interconnected by rivers, the Huntsville Lakes of Vernon, Ferry, Peninsula and Mary, the Muskoka Lakes of Joseph, Rosso and Muskoka, Lake of Bays, and countless smaller lakes, and it's because Muskoka is close to major urban populations in the south. Above all, it's because the natural environment is healthy and glorious to enjoy. Our boating stories were filmed on Lakes Muskoka, Rosso, and Joseph. They are big lakes. From Gravenhurst to Port Carling is 27 kilometers. Port Carling to the north tip of Lake Rosso, 16 kilometers and from the top of Lake Joe to Gravenhurst, 57 kilometers. The thin blue line connecting Lake Muskoka to Lake Rosso is the Indian River, and the village of Port Carling straddles the river. In the heart of Port Carling, locks and a dam tame what once were rapids at that point, with a height difference of about 1.2 meters between Lakes Muskoka and Rosso. Here's a late aerial shot of Port Carling. With the Indian River lower left flowing from Lake Rosso and on into Lake Muskoka upper right. With the locks in the heart of the village. To ensure you have your bearings, I've included the location of the LCBO. Wooden boat building evolved through the last century in Port Carling. It started in the 1890s when W.J. Johnson Sr. started building renting and selling rowboats from his shop just below the locks. Skilled boat builder John Matheson joined the operation in 1892. By about 1900, Johnson had a livery on the docks on the mainland side of the channel, and his nephew W.J. Johnson Jr. joined the business. Beside that livery was competitor Henry Ditchburn's shop. By 1907, the authorities required the two buildings to move across the channel to the island side to allow ships of the day improved passenger access. By 1904, Johnson started building a gasoline-powered launches, and then in 1914 came the invention of the device, the unique feature of the disappearing propeller boat. More on that in a moment. By 1917, Johnson moved Dippy production to the new three-story plant just downstream. Meantime, in 1910, John Matheson left Johnson and set up shop across the river. By selling in 1924 to the Duke family, the Duke boats business got underway. The Dispro Company encountered business problems leading to bankruptcy in 1925. Johnson left and with colleagues started Port Carling Boat Works, but left that enterprise in 1929, returning to the old Dispro plant where he removed the top two stories of the building and continued building Johnson boats into the 50s. Meanwhile, John Matheson went back into business again in 1927, finally retiring in 1941. One more note. Tom Gravett worked for Ditchburn's livery business in Port Carling in the summer season and the Gravenhurst plant in the winters and later went on to found Gravett Boats in 1930. The point in recording this timeline is to demonstrate the ever-changing dynamic boat building business in Port Carling over many decades. Here are the two liveries on the mainland side. About 1902, when the pavilion had just been built on the left. The pavilion is still there today. And here in 1907 are the two liveries moved over to the island. The banner says Windermere Regatta, 
Saturday, August 10th, 1907. With the liveries gone, there's more room for ships and passengers on the west side of the channel. Here are passengers in all their finery. This is the Johnson Boat Building Shop, about 1914. And here is John Matheson's shop, which he sold to the Dukes in 1924. That's Hannah's store in the background. And here is the three-story Dispro plant built in 1917, with the storage building built about 1920. The boats were built on the second floor of the plant, finished on the third floor, moved across the storage shed via that beam you see in between the buildings, and finally brought back to the main floor of the plant for installation of the engine. After the Dispro company went bankrupt in 1925, Billy Johnson and colleagues started the Port Carling Boat Works. Then in 1929, Johnson returned to the old plant, removed the top two stories, and kept building boats. This picture was taken after the original Dispro storage building, was then, which was then owned by Dukes, burned in 1930, and was replaced with a new structure. To finish off these timeline images, here's Dukes, the way the building looked about 2009. Between 1916 and 1958, over 3,100 dippies were produced. After the business folded in Port Carling, the boats were built in various locations, including finally back in Muskoka starting in late 1936, thanks to Tom Gravett, who had worked decades before in the Ditchburn livery in Port Carling, right next door to the Johnson delivery. Port Carling about 2,025 boats, Tonawanda in New York about 500 boats built, Lindsay about 170 boats, and then Gravette back in Muskoka about 400 boats. And here is a splendid little boat as advertised. Note the protecting skeg, which pushes the propeller up into the device inside the hull when the boat meets an obstacle, like a log or a sandbar. Here's a closer look. Now the Sagamo was considerably bigger than the Dippy, but the two craft would share the Indian River approaching Port Carling from Lake Rosso. The Sagamo's large displacement caused what is called the squat effect. When a ship seems to suck the water out of the narrow channel as it passes by, lowering the water level quite noticeably. After the ship passes, the water rushes back in like a little tsunami. With our family cottage on the river, we witness this phenomenon with the passing of ships on a regular basis. My father and uncle loved the ships and took 8mm movies. We're now going to take a Muskoka minute to watch some footage. You'll see ships passing in the river. During that minute, I am going to read Paul Doddington's anecdote about a trip on the river with his frail and elderly aunt in their dippy about 1950. In those days, dippy owners took it as a matter of proper seamanship always to pass on the wrong side of every boy and my aunt was no exception. On a trip to Port Carling one sunny day, we were heading over a very shallow sandy area in the Indian River, on the wrong side of the markers as usual, when the large 750-ton passenger steamer Sagamo passed by. For a brief moment, the ship drew all the water out from beneath our little dippy, and there we were sitting high and dry on the sand, with the propeller thrashing about up in its housing. In a silent panic, I glanced at my aunt to see what she would do in this terrible predicament. A second or two later, when the wash returned, we were gently floated off the sand, and my aunt, with an air of utter nonchalance, shoved the device handle firmly back down again with her foot. Had she been Sir Malcolm Campbell himself, I doubt I would have been more impressed. And while we're on steamboats, here is RMS Seguin heading downstream on the Indian River for Port Carling about a decade ago. I love the echo of her whistle, which demonstrates why our Turnbull ancestors named the family cottage Echo.
If you go online and search DISPRO Owners Association, you'll find their homepage. Poke around a bit and you'll understand that they are a fun-loving bunch who simply love their boats. To make the point, here are 18 members of the DISPRO Owners Association, all in Paul Gockel's boat in 1982. Two questions come to mind. Why would they do that? And did they go anywhere? To the second question, yes, they motored across the water to another dock without sinking. As for why, because back in 1920, 18 men got in a dippy and did the same thing, probably as a marketing stunt back then. And besides, in 1982, it was simply great fun. The smile on this woman's face proves that cruising along in a dippy is an absolute delight. On the other hand, this woman needs a little bit of reassuring that everything's going to be okay. Here's the scene at Pinelands Beach on Lake Joseph in 1982 at the Dispro Owners Association Annual Regatta. And here are fun-loving dippy people flying high on the Big Chute Marine Railway, Trent Severn Canal, in 1998. Let's enjoy the movie shot by Chris Bolan last summer, with thanks to Paul, Tom, and Carrie. The place that we live in over there is, is called Bory Raw House. It was a, one of those small summer resorts in Muskoka. There were many of them in those days. They all seem to have red roofs, you know. They're <laughs> winter here house and they're painted white. And this boat was used to ferry the guests because the, the steamers wouldn't go all the way down to the Arthur Lee Bay over here it was too far and there wouldn't be enough people. So the reason that the boat has the name of the resort on it was that people were told to get off the Sagamo or whatever it was and look around on the docks till they see a boat that has the name. And that was the thing. So this was the boat that was used to bring people. And it would always come through the cut, you know, the canoe cut or cut. And it would bring people through there. And I have photographs of it in the 1920s, loaded up in the bow with bags of flour and God knows what all stuff, you know. It, and my aunt owned the boat, and I don't know what she paid for, probably about $575, I think, was about the going rate in those days. But it's the, it's the deluxe model, and it, uh, and put 18 people in them according to the picture, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah, but you, you can put a lot. And I remember as a boy when she was a very old lady, um, she would take us once a year on a good run. We'd go down Lake Muskoka, we might go to Bala, or we'd go down, say, to Bomaris. And there were all kinds of places where you could have a shore lunch in those days, and that was wonderful. And I remember I was the guy, because I was about 10 or 11 years old, I always had to take the front seat out and bail the boat, because by this time it was getting pretty leaky and old, you see. And my brother and I were, were instructed to kneel on the front seat and watch out for rocks. So I, that's how you keep the kids occupied, you know, so they've got a job to do. And, and I also had to put the gas in the tank and I had to and the gas, I still have the jar. It was a, it was one of those uh, sort of a vinegar jar, you know, one gallon jar. I still use that. And it's handy because it's glass and you pour the gas in it and if there's any water in the gas you can see it before you dump it in the gas tank. So I still use that, you know. And we'd strain gas through an old felt hat. 
So we'd go and have this lunch. We'd have the whole boat filled with aunts and uncles, all the wicker hampers full of um, goodies. And we'd have a, a really nice lunch. And then about mid-afternoon, everybody decides, day like today, you know, decide it's time to come home. So we'd, we'd start coming home, and you'd get about to the mouth of the Indian River, the south end, and the engine would start running slightly unevenly. And, you know, the kind of the exuberant mood would kind of change, because <laughs> there were kind of clouds on the horizon, which usually did appear after a little while. And I remember going on these trips year after year, and I don't ever remember one trip where we actually made it all the way home without somebody having to row the last half mile or something. And, and I remember my aunt would look very worried and she'd fiddle with the controls and sometimes that helped and sometimes it didn't. But, you know, there's probably batteries going dead, you know, just slowly and things like that. So I, did, I fell in love with the boat when I was a kid. I used to sit in the, in the boathouse and just watch it for hours. I, the noise of the rudder squeaking away. And, and there are a lot of, there's a lot of damage on this side of the boat from nails that used to hold tires onto a dock. And the, and the tires all fell off, but the heads of the nails were still there. So along about the middle of the boat on this side, there's an awful lot of little dash marks from the nails, you know. But I was a little kid and I, I thought that was the way it was supposed to be. You, you, know, you don't realize those things when you're young, you know. So anyway, I've had to live with, you know, trying to prevent them from getting any worse. And there are cracks along here. That's from the years when there was no boathouse and the boat had to be kept turned over upside down on a rock, so you'd roll it over in the gunnel and that would crack the plank there and so on. But uh, these floorboards are not the originals. They were put in about 1930 by the Port Carling Boat Works. So somebody smartened up and realized, well, Dickies all leak, and therefore you have to have your floorboards raised up a little bit. You'll see that there's a little bit of water in the bilge now, and that's all correct. Well, this boat was so bad and so derelict it was it was gray i mean there was no color no varnish left on it at all the idea was to tow this boat out after we got pinafore going and it's an earlier boat it's like page on and start so we put a lot of rocks in this boat took the engine everybody saves the engine you know because it's pretty and we watched it going down and Nora and I were there in Pinafore and this thing was getting lower and lower in the water and I thought, you know, this is my family history. I can't let this happen. So we threw all the rocks out of the boat and towed the thing back to shore and by that time it was getting up close to the gunnels. <laughs> and so that's when I decided I had to restore this because it was the family boat. And it wasn't the same as the other one and, you know, the difference was but one thing that was interesting, Hurricane Hazel hit Muskoka on uh, October 15, 1954. And it, it, there were a lot of winds and so on. It, it tore open the door of the boathouse that this was in. And the boat got away and it vanished. And my aunt went out the next day and she went all around the shore to try to find everything that had floated out of the boat. So she got the oars and nearly all of the seats, the front seat back still original. The seat bottom is not because there were probably tools in it and it probably, you know, sank or something, but it wasn't in the boat. The boat was at the bottom of Lake Rosso all winter. Nobody knew where it was. Stan Carr was out canoeing in the spring, paddling along out in front of Gibson's place and which is about you know, a tenth of a mile from our boathouse. And he looks over and there it is. It's down there. It's in 20 feet of water. <laughs> so they somehow got hooks under the thing and brought it up. And they had to change the, drain the water out of the engine, of course, and get some new coil and new battery and new gas. And away it went. 
So, but that was probably the reason why all the varnish came off because it spent the entire winter at the bottom of the lake. So, so it's never missed a year on the lakes. It's always been running every year. So that's kind of a fun story. Baysong is a 1920 disappearing propeller boat, so it's uh, one of the earliest uh, that's still going in the fleet. She's new to me. She was uh, discovered in a, under a cottage on Georgian Bay by John and Happy Thompson in the 80s and restored and uh, run by them for a number of years. And I was uh, lucky enough to become her custodian when they decided it was time to sell it. But, Dispros, when they first started, and until 1922, hadn't figured out any way to control engine from the helm seat, which is this seat to just the rear of the middle of the boat. If you want to start the engine, if you want to stop the engine, slow it down, or adjust the carburetor, you had to lean over this seat or climb into the front compartment in order to do it. So it requires a certain agility and a certain familiarity with the motors so that you don't put your fingers in the wrong place. One of the features of this boat is the top. They discovered it by serendipity when they were looking for other Dispro parts. It's the only original Dispro auto top left in existence as far as we know. They were advertised in the catalog for two or three years but they added half as much again to the price of the boat as the total price, so they obviously weren't very popular. Uh, and I find, I'm very glad I've got it because it just is a wonderful air conditioning unit. It keeps the sun off you and it also funnels the air through in sort of a pitot tube effect. So you've got, on a hot day, a lovely breeze blowing over you all of the time. The motor is a Model D, which is one of the uh, earlier Dispro motors. It's been very reliable, but uh, it has to run well because you have to lean over the back of the front seat or climb into the front seat and flip the flywheel in order to start. It's not running well. There's not much margin for error. The improvements that were made, the rudder is uh, not as deep as the rudder on the later boats so that if somebody's sitting in the front seat and uh, then you, the rudder comes up out of the water and it's rather difficult to steer. The other thing device which is the heart of the disappearing propeller boat. It's the, the unit into which the propeller will raise either if a rock hits the skeg in front of it or if you lift the lever. This one is held up just by a ratchet which obviously, or not obviously, but always is too loose or else too tight. The later boats they put a, a brake on it so that it worked better. The name that John and Happy uh, put on the boat based on is the, uh, the first part of the Ojibwe name for Port Carling, uh, based on rapids, uh, with, with the rapids where the locks are now, the small locks. Gladys is a 1947 brevet dippy. After the original company went bankrupt in 1926, the patents and the patterns were bought by someone in Lindsay who built a few boats and then Gravette uh, purchased the patterns and built the boats until about the mid 50s. So as I said this is a 1947 model built by Gravette. It was found by Doug Brown in about 1984, stored by him and has been a member of the uh, Dispro Owners Association since its inception. I purchased the boat from Ann Brown last Christmas. The idea was to see if uh, Dispro would uh, lend itself to repowering from gasoline engines, which are fun but a little bit cranky and hard to operate, to electricity, which is uh, dead simple to operate. Credit for the idea has to be given to Kerry Harmon, who is an engineer by profession and who did a lot of work collecting the information on a number of boats, not exactly dippies, but dippy light boats that had been electrified and producing the criteria or the appropriate durance for the boat. The idea was that she should be able to keep up with the Dispro fleet, which goes about six or six and a half miles an hour, 
and she should be able to do that for a minimum of five hours. Using Carrie's numbers, we took out the St. Lawrence engine and put in this package, the motor, the controller, and the drive are all a package produced by the electric yacht company in Minnesota, primarily for sailboats. This motor can be configured to run on uh, 24, 36, or 48 volts, and will produce power in accordance with that. We chose the 36 volt arrangement, and so the power is in these two batteries. They're each 100 amp hour, 36 volt batteries. They're wired in parallel, so that gives you the equivalent of a 200 amp hour, 36 volt battery. Carrie's numbers said that going at six or six and a half miles an hour, we should be able to go for five hours. What we've uh, proven is that we're getting more closer to six or seven hours. And if you're prepared to uh, drop the speed half a mile an hour to five and a half, you can go for eight or nine hours. Installation has been a very successful one. It's smooth, it's quiet. As Paul Doddington said when he came out in it, you can hear the birds singing when it's going. We think that perhaps there's a future, not, all, not for all the dippies, but for those people who find the engines a challenge. This seems like a good solution that will keep the boats going and uh, allow tremendous ease of operation. And you don't get your hands greasy.
Thanks to all who made this episode possible. A special salute to Dispro owners everywhere for the stewardship of their craft. Join us next week in episode 4 as we visit three more boats demonstrating grace and speed, Ilutu, Dix, and Curlew. Eagle 2, 1927, 36 feet. Dix, Ditchburn Racer, 1927, 21 feet. And Curlew, a 1936 Gravette, 33 feet, Streamliner. Happy cruising. Remember, wood is good. And we'll see you next episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, welcome back the, uh, the, again to another wonderful presentation this evening. Uh, I found that the uh, the maps that Ian put up at the very beginning were extremely helpful, especially with the land markers as we're looking uh, across Muskoka. Uh, the cruise that uh, both um, uh, you know Paul and and Tom took us on tonight was very enjoyable. It was very scenic. I got to see a lot of the shoreline, and uh, it was a great a great little way to start the uh, uh, the getting ready for the summer season for the Dispros. And I must say, I do know a lot about the fun that the Dispro Club has because uh, one of the panelists, Mary Story, will tell me every weekend about the fun the Dispro Group has had. So it is a great organization to be part of as well. Our first question tonight, I'm going to ask uh, John Miller. And the question is, what range and speed will the refurbished one to three have between charges? Uh, okay, thanks, Ann. Um Wanda will be able to sail uh, for about five hours uh, at her regular cruising speed of six or seven knots, which is about uh, 11 or 12 kilometers an hour. So we can go faster or slower than that, of course, and that will have a, a different effect on the batteries. But Wanda also has a couple of onboard generators that can charge the batteries while we're cruising. So, uh, so yeah, so that's the answer. Okay. So now we'll get on to some of the disparate questions we have waiting in the Q&A. The first one being, uh, what is the draft of a Dispro boat? So maybe Murray or Ed, you could answer that. I think I'll defer to Ed on that one. <laughs> or even Mary on that one, I think. Something I don't really know. It's probably going. six or eight inches, I would say. Mary, did you have anything to add to that? No, I, I would agree with Ed. Um, somewhere between six and eight inches mm -hmm. depends how many people are in the boat True. Uh, Jordan. Jordan lakes. <laughs> i remember uh, one boat that had a uh, buchanan midget engine in it does that qualify <laughs> uh, jordan, jordan my camera i can't enable it because you turned it off and i you probably had cause but anyway <laughs> there okay i will now start the video uh, just to the point that Rick just made, I thought about putting a picture in of that particular Dispro. I got a couple of pictures in my collection of Dispros, which uh, let's say they don't have their original power. And one of them is that boat with a little Buchanan midget, which is a four-cylinder engine. What is it? 24 horsepower, I think, Ed? 25. Bar 25, barreling across the uh, bay <laughs> over here. And then I have another picture of a Dispro up in Cameron Bay near Rosso, powered by a steam engine, if you'd believe it. Um, so Dispros have been converted to other than electric power, as we saw today. Great. So who's still building Dispros today? Uh, Mike Windsor of Windsor Boat Works has built uh, two or three of them. Uh, Mark Harwick uh, out of Huntsville has built one. Um, there are some line drawings of Dispros that Joe Fossey did several years ago. So uh, some people are building a one of, uh, but I think Windsor Boat Works has built uh, two or three. Okay. The next question is, um, can a future episode talk more about 
uh, the boat and engine restoration, about boat and engine rest restoration? Uh, yes, I would think that what that's, what the question's really getting at is who's, who's doing the restoration these days, uh, uh, both of the hulls and the engines. And we have very skilled people throughout Muskoka doing that. And that is a very good subject. If anybody is concerned at all about not being able to have their boat um, brought up to snuff in terms of its original condition and or its original engine, fear not. There are very skilled people out there. We, we will address that in a future episode. Great, thank you. It just wasn't part of our uh, mandate this year. That's right. Okay. So the next question is, how is the DISPRO steered? I'll answer that one. Um, <laughs> there is a rope that goes from bow to stem, uh, stern uh, on both sides and it's attached to the rudder. So uh, you simply pull the rope um, towards you if you wanna go to the right and uh, the person on the other side pulls it to the left to go that way. Uh, but some of us have put a little wheel in between. So it looks like a very small uh, wooden wheel that would be almost on one of the ships. And it's a little easier on the hand than holding a rope all the time. But it is pulled uh, by pulling a rope, you can steer the boat. Great. Can you tell us more about powering wooden boats with electric motors? I'm not sure who the expert on that's going to be. Tom gave us a very good rundown in the video about the conversion of a dispro to electric power. We know that Stan Hunter has converted some Duke Playmates to electric power. Stan has a shop in Milford Bay. Uh, we know the Wanda is being converted to electric power. And uh, beyond that, I, I'm not aware of any other boats in the vicinity that are being uh, converted. Okay. Uh, the, the big one boat on Lake of Bays has been converted. Good point. But it kept its steam engine installed so you can look at it. Oh, really? Then in the U.S., of course, uh, the Elko, they build uh, electric boats. And That's sell a variety of electric engines. And those, those boats were built originally. Like The electrification of boats is not new, right? Didn't yeah. it happen a century ago or more? Yeah, uh, I would say so. El Elko has been around for over 100 years. It's short for electric launch company. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there any large Dispro boats that are made in Lindsay or that, yeah, that were made in Lindsay? Almost all Dispro boats are either 16 feet or 18 feet. The early ones were 16. So none of them are any longer than each other. Um, okay. That's sort of part of the club that everybody's boat is very, very similar in length and size. Um, so Lindsay's I think maybe there were some 16 footers built there, but no, I think, no, they were all 18 footers. So the, the Lindsay boats are a little bit different, but they all look very similar to the ones built in Port Carling and in Gravenhurst. And uh, Mary, the John Bull, it was just wider. Yeah. But the length was the same. Okay, is there, um, is, can you find a mechanic to fix a disparate engine today? <laughs> Paul Doddington. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there any boat building in Port Carling today or boat restoration? Well, we touched on that a moment ago and the, the, the the, the short answer is yes, there is. Uh, James Osler has a very busy shop. Rob Garrix has a busy shop. Uh, anybody else added in Port Carling? But there are shops. There are shops to and fro. We shouldn't just stick with Port Carling. Murray, you were going to say something. No, I'm oh, innocent. Okay, <laughs> maybe it was that. I thought I saw somebody pitching in. You know, if we go north to south, and danger and 
or south to north the danger in doing this is leaving somebody out but gary clark has a a busy shop that does wonderful work on Winharrow road between gravenhurst and bracebridge uh, i mentioned james osler here kurt hillman and milford bay we see these we see these various shops in the acbs spring tour chris uh, back me up here what shops am i missing tim butson there you go. Like Windsor, like um, Windsor. I don't know whether they still operating or not. Oh yes, yeah. yes. It's yeah, got two, two dippies in there right now. Uh, Paul Brackley, Gravenhurst. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. He's building new. Our spring tour will be on video again this year, so you'll be able to see restorations there. Okay, so the next question is, and maybe Mary, this will go to you. Where can you buy the book, The Greatest Little Motor Boat Afloat? Well, it's completely out of print and has been for several years. I tried to convince the um, printing house to put it back into circulation, but no way. Um, there's used books out. In fact, we have, I think, two of them at the Muskoka Discovery Center for sale. Um, but you do find them in antique stores and uh, various antique bookstores, antique markets once in a while, uh, but you have to find them on the secondary market. And there's probably some on the internet for sale. Okay, so the ships seem to be going fast in the old films. Did they really go that fast? <laughs> yes, they did. The, the, the film has not been speeded up. Um, in fact, I get a kick out of looking at some of the films because I think the uh, captains today are, what's the right words to use, John? They're, they're reasonably uh, careful. And, and when you see, I've, there's a film we could, we could find on the internet. It's a marketing film for the province of Ontario, shot in the late 20s. And in fact, I, I could put up a little bit of a clip in the in a future episode. It's really sort of fun. The Sagamo is coming into the locks from the Lake Rosso side, and then she leaves the locks and she goes barreling by at apparent full, well, it wouldn't be quite full steam because she just left the locks. And there was a ship meantime docked in front of Dukes. <laughs> there's, there's no hesitation. It's just barreling off. And if you remember, if you remember in the video we just saw today of the Sagamo, she was leaving the locks and making a very hard turn to, to, uh, to port. Uh, you, you may recall that with streamers um, tailing off her stern. Uh, you could see how quickly she was going and she was just spewing out water behind her stern there. There, there was a lot of power in the goal. So yes, they went that fast. And the pictures of them passing in the river, I remember seeing that kind of scene, but they, they really barreled right along. A very good outboard to catch up to the Seguin or the, the, the Sagamo. Sagamo was fast. Okay, I've just found a, a question in the, uh, the panelist chat. And the question is how many dippies have a reverse gear? Did that. We did that? Okay. Well, some of the, some of the gravettes didn't. Didn't they, Mary? Didn't yes. some of the a wee few of them? Okay. Okay. And then so, don't forget what don't forget what Tom said. If you're really nimble, uh, I think it was Tom who said it. Couldn't you, or maybe Paul? Uh, couldn't you start the engine in reverse? Or or you could turn <laughs> it off, and when it was just about ready to, the wheel was ready to stop. Turn this back on, and the engine will run backwards. And you, I think pull up, would... you pull up the the, uh, the propeller into the device and that helps it go backwards as well. Yes. I, I think we should do another whole episode on Dippy's Landing and have all, <laughs> have all these various methodologies displayed. Uh, just a little bit of an update. One of the, uh, the participants tonight has, has identified that the greatest little motorboat afloat can be found on Amazon US. And uh, there's a link in the, uh, the Q&A to um, if anyone's looking for that book on Amazon.com. 
So Mary, I have a question for you, and it's a little bit about the DISPRO organization. Maybe you can tell us about some of those fun things that the DISPRO club does almost every weekend. Well, the DIPPY club is a, known as the DISPRO Owners Association, but DOA for short, is a, one of the most fun groups I've ever met in my life. I've joined a lot of groups. Um, so they have a lot of events. Um, the highlight of the group is a regatta in the fall. It's the weekend after Labor Day. And we go to a resort, usually someplace in central Ontario, but we have even gone into the Finger Lakes in the U.S. And uh, we spend Friday afternoon, all day Saturday and all day Sunday boating. And there's a lot of rituals to it and a lot of fun at the meals. And we have silly little games and races and dippies and all kinds of things like that. Um, the other events, events uh, we have a tent and look for membership at the Antique and Classic Boat Society's show in Gravenhurst, which is happening this year on July the 9th. Um, and three or four times a year, we have what is called a UUMMT, which sounds very funny. Um, it's known as the Unauthorized, Unorganized Mini Misery Tour, which again is just an acronym for something silly. But we set up a lake or a river, a date and a time, and people just bring their boats, bring their lunch, and we go boating for the day. And those can be, again, any place in Ontario um, and into upper New York State. Um, a, just a real fun day of boating. All you have to do to organize it is give everybody a chart for that. Uh, we have an annual meeting among ourselves, and I think that's about it. But um, it Dippies are very trailerable. You need a lightweight trailer. Uh, they're not heavy to carry behind your vehicle. And um, people really enjoy getting out and enjoying it. One year we had our dippy in 19 different waterways. So uh, that's the kind of thing you can do with dippies is just go and explore different waterways and see the scenery. Uh, do you still do the annual uh, Georgian Bay trip? Well, that really was never part of the whole club. It was a group of people within the club. And yes, some people are still doing that, where people go out for a whole week and they just camp on islands on Georgian Bay and uh, don't have uh, any technology and uh, enjoy the scenery. <laughs> Great. Well, that's uh, all the Q&As that we have for this week. And uh, I'll, I'll bring it back to John. Okay, Ian, is there anyone else have any comments or are we good? No, we're all set to move in the next week. Okay, well, that's wonderful. Well, thank you all uh, our panelists again for, uh, for your time and uh, for a great presentation once again. Uh, and to our audience, we had over 140 people on tonight, I believe. So uh, next week, four o'clock uh, Wednesday, we'll see you then. Thanks very much. <laughs>